Wales, the Kingdom of Wales, or the nation of Wales in the United Kingdom. And uh, Brother Richard and Rachel, great to see you again. Good to see you and ready uh, on, on, on the front lines, as it were, to, to share mm -hmm. the history and, the, and prophetic, give us a prophetic picture of our future in Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus, and by his spirit. Amen. All right. Yes. Go ahead. Bless you, Jerry. Uh, and your, your words and your song were absolutely spot on with what today requires of me. And I come to you merely as a humble servant. A very difficult time to come, according to the headlines of the world, but easy because God is in this and he is profoundly listening in anticipation as to what's coming because he loves to hear the truth about himself spoken against all the lies which abound at this present time. So I'm, the day uh, this starts in first part is looking back to the Welsh revival, which you know all about now, of course, and we've had two days of it and you've seen how it was birthed and, and seen how it grew. There, it was obviously impossible to put the whole story across, but the essence of it was there. Then the second session, we're going to look ahead to the enormous revival that is going to come. This is probably the most challenging word I have ever had to give. I ask you to pray for me. Um, but but I, I've been up in the night with, with the Lord about this. But there is no other word that I can bring but one of utmost hope in spite of how bad the headlines in the newspapers are. Anyway, let's start where I said we'd begin and look back at the Welsh revival um, to pick out the good points, but also the things that weren't so good. And, and you know, man is an imperfect vessel and the Lord trusts his word to imperfect vessels. And you saw for yourselves how Evan Roberts had profound instruction from the Lord, almost like Moses did during the night, but actually he still had to learn the road he was treading day by day, and it threw up all sorts of challenges. And the same with dear R.V. Jones. What a character. Two very different people, and God used them, uh, each in his own way, and blessed them both. Well, looking back on the Welsh Revival, a lot of people criticise it. They say it was so temporary. It wasn't. Anybody who received what the Welsh Revival was offering, which was what God was offering, and it was it was heaven to earth and they were blessed right through their lives it was and absolutely because what god gives from heaven to earth is of his making what we try and build ourselves towards him which unfortunately is what church life can be all about and um, that can perish and does but the, the what the blessing that was received a lot of people didn't know what on earth had happened to them. And this happens when the Holy Spirit comes down. And we, we have then a learning curve. And wow, <laughs> um, we had, I had no idea what had happened to me in full the day it happened. Um, it, it, was, it was bewildering. And it was also, I feared very much, it was a challenge that I was going to have to live up to. And I hope you, you were blessed yesterday by the words of Joseph Jenkins, the words that he spoke about being all the difference between God starting something in our lives and then expecting us to finish it. No, um, he talked about God starting something in our lives and God wanting to finish it, to be given that privilege of finishing it himself. And really, it's so simple. If you look at the scriptures, he, he, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And if he's the author, who else can I turn to, least of all myself, to finish it? And that's been the story of our lives. And that's why I'm sitting here now. So revival was actually proved in the people who really received the Holy Spirit and were baptized by it, by enduring to the end. And those people who were blessed in that way had that knowledge and that faith 
planted in them right from the beginning. But like all these things, it has to be proved by enduring to the end. And in the end, that was, that was what does prove the word of God, because the word of God does not come back to him void or empty. The other point was about revival. Just as Jesus was given specifically to the Jews, and, and but Jesus had to learn on his feet in that sense as well, because um, he recognized people came to him who weren't um, who weren't Jews, and he, he took each one according to the faith they'd been given, because he read on them the, the promise of God. And that was lovely, so that the Lord was able to move as a human being in the snapshot of the moment, if I can put it like that, but he also had the downloaded guidance from his father, who, um, who he obviously knew so closely. Um, but revival is always given to the church in, in, in the same way that Jesus was given to the Jews, because it is the church that God is going to raise up. That is tremendously relevant to today, because we know we're in the last days now, because the times are so accelerating and the signs are all there and um, that the Bible talks about. Um, it's like a, a, a focus that's, that's upon us. We can't put it down. And the church at the moment is extremely weak. Of course, there are, one, there are some wonderful exceptions to that. But as a body as a whole, the church needs revival. Now, the thing about revival is that if you've never been in revival, and I put my hand up to that in a way, um, you cannot know what revival was really like. And that was the, the problem at the start of the last revival. Uh, there were those that did know what it was like, was they were alive, the older men. It was, it was um, leading up to the revival. It was actually 45 years between the 1859 and the 1904 revival. And they knew what it was like. And yet they couldn't create that in their children because God has children, doesn't he? But he doesn't have grandchildren. So um, it, it's one of these things that one has to learn and pick up for oneself and seek it for oneself and it shall surely come. But the church was the essence of what the revival was sent for um, because that is what needs to be revived. And it's the same now. We've had a longer spell than ever um, between revivals, so we're overdue for another one. Now, I, I also make the point that, and this is so encouraging, I, I want you to be terribly encouraged by this, because it's a wonderful piece of news, that re the revival experience can come personally without you having to be in a revival. Do you understand that? Um, and I, we didn't know anything about the Welsh Revival when we came to North Wales. Um, I knew there had been one, but I, I didn't give it any attention. And we didn't realise that we were parked at the foot of the very mountain where the Holy Spirit came down on those quarry workers. And so the whole thing to us has been um, a revelation. But as soon as we went into the story of the Welsh Revival and lo looked it up, we knew immediately that was exactly what happened to us without there being a revival at all. We were going away from the Lord at the time in bitter disappointment. Remember that slide of Evan Roberts with his hand up to his forehead where he said, Christianity is a disappointment. It's such, it's such a disappointment. Falls so far short um, of what it should have been in, as it was in the New Testament. And that's how it was with us. We had to find our way without knowing what has happened to us we had to learn it day by day and that's a wonderful thing but the revival experience if you seek it yes it can come and it can come very suddenly and completely unannounced right it comes personally i put down here in my notes simply by seeking god for who he really is and that is where the battle rages it is over who God really is. And when you find him and he finds you, he shows you who you really are as well. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven to earth. Now, finding his personal holiness opens the door. Because his personal holiness 
is is absolutely unarguable and it is so amazingly beautiful but so incredibly humbling wow it opens the door to the most incredible salvation because do you know my friends real repentance is a gift from heaven by the moment for the moment it's very easy for us to try and summon up a, a heart of stone or a cold heart a heart that's gone cold or whatever um, and try and make ourselves repent uh, it's a battle inside us but not when he comes if you seek him the answers all lie utterly utterly in him and i'm so pleased they do if ever i get blown up and i hope i never do <laughs> rachel would stop me quick enough if it happened then the lord said who were you when i came and saved you and i know i was saved like a drowned rat and the only reason why the Lord came to save me was that he knew that I knew I could never, ever do anything about myself. That's a sobering thing to say, but he brings me back to that often, especially if I've had a success somewhere. The success is all his, not mine. Well, there were thousands who were truly saved, and those that were, they did endure to the end. Because what God does lasts. I'm going to say this here. It's I was going to say it in the next talk. What God does lasts. The thing is that He doesn't want to build on what we do. Um, it's very tempting to think that we do our very best and in our church or and in our own lives. It's really our own lives I'm talking about, and and we we build ourselves up towards God. And one of the problems with the Welsh revival, you see was that the pastors and the people expected that the Lord was going to add his bricks on top of what the church had already, or what they had already. Now, that is, that's a very likely scenario. You know, you think, well, we've, we've done our bit and look at the Lord's going to build on this and make what we've got higher. The Lord didn't do that at all. He laid new bricks in revival that people never knew existed. Why did he do that? Why didn't he add to the bricks we've done? It's because God, God knows that our best efforts, which are of man, are going to crumble. Uh, they're not going to stand persecution and the test of time. Now, imagine that God has built bricks from the kingdom upon bricks of our making. When the foundations of those bricks cave in, as they will if they're man-made, God's bricks of heaven shall be seen to crumble, and Satan would have a field day. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, these are, are big issues. And it's the reason why God is jealous to be both the author and the finisher of our lives. Well, let's look at some of the problems that the Welsh Revival had and some of the problems that it actually caused. The first one, it sounds strange to say this, but it was over-enthusiasm. It's uh, such an amazing experience, and a lot of people weren't expecting it at all. They went to revival meetings, um, and they didn't expect to get blessed like that. They didn't expect it to be so easy, so sudden, so totally unexpected. And so um, the people came out of these revival meetings, come on, praising the Lord. They, didn't, they just couldn't stop it. They'd been on the receiving end of a blessing which they knew had been given to them personally. And they had everything to gain and nothing to lose. But there was a lot of over-enthusiasm and crazy things happened. Um, th these guys thought they could, they could pray anything. You probably saw it yesterday. That was, Lord, save every person in this valley. That's a wonderful prayer, actually. Um, uh, but, you know, sometimes one can be over-enthusiastic and it can lead to some unwise decisions. Now, there were many of those People who came to the revival from other churches and from other countries too um, were so impacted by what they saw that their, their first craving of their hearts was to bring it back to their own churches. And what happened, they used to come up to a, a lot of the young people who they'd obviously just been saved, you know, some of the heroes of revival. They were heroes because they'd been blessed from heaven. And they said, look, we want this in our church and we would love you. Please, can we persuade you to come with us and take up a mission in our church to pass the revival on? 
Now to a new convert who had no idea, he knew his life was going to be changed, but didn't know in what ways. That was a big challenge. And it might be a, a call from God if it was, uh, he thought it was, he would get up and go. And a lot of people did that, the young people, they, 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 they were dragged away, they were poached, is the, is the English word for it. It means they were, they were hooked into something that they shouldn't have been. And when they got to the place, um, they just found they weren't ready for it. You know, it was so sad. And a lot of them came back very disappointed, including from foreign countries. Um, it was very, very disappointing. And they came back having failed in the mission. Probably the church rejected the word that they had. And that happens. Jesus was rejected. He knew what it felt like. But it's a very bad start to your journey to, to go on a wrong, um, a wrong mission. The other thing that was a problem with the Welsh Revival was the misuse of tongues. And there are two ways in which this happened. Um, one is that, again, the missionary hopefuls, um, those that wanted to go abroad and, and do things for the Lord straight away, they actually believed that if they spoke in the Amazon jungle to um, the natives, you know, and spoke in tongues, that they'd automatically understand what they were saying. That, that's, you know, we can smile, but that was what, uh, what some of them did believe. And they actually did that. They went out to places like the Amazon jungle. And sure enough, I don't know whether they got eaten or not, but I mean, they, I'm sure the Lord protected them. But, but they had a bitter disappointment that nobody understood a word they said when they spoke in tongues. But Smith Wigglesworth speaks of another problem with tongues. That was the assertion that speaking in tongues was a certain sign, a certain sign of having been baptized with the Spirit. And he was right. Uh, he had more problems, in his, he says, with Christians who thought they were baptized with the Spirit because they spoke in tongues. They caused him more problems than any other group. Um, because there, there are other forms of tongues. There Obviously, there are demonic tongues. I hope that doesn't come into it here. But there were also the gift of what is sometimes known as glossolalia, some of the tribes used to use, you can actually loosen your power over speech and come out with, with sounds of all different kinds. And, and that is a very big issue because there is no such thing in, as security except in real, absolute salvation. And it's about hearts and it's about the changing of the heart that the Lord alone can do but we can long for it and we do well to do that. The next problem of the Welsh Revival, which I touched upon yesterday, was the lack of church support. Uh, because the churches, once they were left to their own, unless they had that new life planted deeply in them, they didn't know how to go on. Uh, even trying to do what the revivalists did and copy Evan Roberts or something wouldn't work on its own. You wouldn't expect it to. But it was hard for the people who really had been saved because they were now they were new wine and they needed new new bottles, new wine skins, didn't they? And so a lot of them, as you know, broke away and started Pentecostalism. That was good, but there was no follow up very often. They, um, they, were, they just had themselves. There were elder statesmen. But there were some who were able to guide them and there were certain magazines and publications to help them. And um, R.B. Jones was particularly involved in that side of things. But the underlying problem was, you know, that often the churches and even the pastors themselves were secretly waiting for it to fade away. They wanted their normality back. My friends, that was very serious. And that was one of the big reasons why revival, revival didn't last longer than it did. The, even the pastors were waiting for it to fade away. They wanted to go on as they were, not be challenged, know what was going to happen Sunday by Sunday, and, and just everything go back to normal. That, in biblical terms, is nothing less than looking back to Egypt. What they were delivered from. Look, if you look back over your shoulder, that does not please the Lord whatsoever, because that is a true sign of where your heart is and it's not where it should be and likewise the control spirit 
has always been a problem. And the Welsh revival actually stimulated that in the churches that didn't want it. Um, they, they very quickly clamped down on it. And you saw examples of that very, very well um, yesterday and even the day before, that they come against the revival. And the control spirit in the church is even stronger because of it. Now, that's not actually a criticism of the revival, but it is a criticism of the way the churches uh, came against it. And, you know, that's so common. It's so sad that very often to somebody who really is of the Lord, but happens to be outside the church mold, if you understand what I'm saying, is frequently come against by the church. I won't mention any names, but we are so privileged and in our travels, um, we get invited to the most amazing thing to be with the leaders. Um, and they we're with the leaders because they, I don't know, I, I do know, to be honest, that they, they, they say it all the time. It's such an encouragement to them to find somebody who's been saved for over 50 years and is still on fire for the Lord. And they say, like they said to Reverend Roberts in a way, you know, what's your secret? And I, you know, I don't have a secret. I know the answer. The answer is simple. It's because Jesus lit the fire. And, and that is, that's his fire. And it, it won't go out. I know that. But it's still got to be tested until the end of my days, obviously. So there was some very heavy shepherding that came into the churches after the revival to make sure it didn't happen again. But there was also wrong theology that came in the aftermath of revival. There was a concept, and then some of you may still believe this today, I hope not, but if so, um, I hope you'll see through it now. They, they introduced a concept of what I'm going to call two-tier Christianity. That means two levels of Christianity. Now, you might say there are certain things in the Bible that do appear to support that. Um, but the baptism of John was undoubtedly um, a meaningful tear. And then the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the other tear up here. But there's a misunderstanding amongst the vast majority of church people, and most certainly those who oppose um, the, the revival. That the, the, the baptism of the Spirit is an optional extra. It's not. I think John the Baptist spoke extremely clearly when he said, I baptize with water, and that was absolutely valid. And baptism means complete immersion. But one is coming who is far greater than I am. I'm not even fit to take off his sample. And he is going to baptize, same word, with the Holy Spirit. And complete immersion in the Holy Spirit is more than an experience. It is actually a complete baptism into newness of life. And it is the baptism of the Spirit, yes. But it's also, in our experience, undoubtedly, new birth. And how many discovered that? Ministers and uh, pastors who went forward to the cross in repentance with the rest of their congregation. It was hard for them, wasn't it? But when they were baptized, they were baptized into newness of life and, and, and were free to admit it too. I mean, there's nothing to hide. Come on. <laughs> all that labor for all those years, and now I've found something better. That's what it's all about. There was also, I think, in, in the uh, experience of the revival, a, a, a confusion between the conviction and conversion. And, and, and definitions can be a, a real snare. Just take your phone away. With you. um, it, it can, there's uh, Siri talking to me on the mobile phone. He's supposed to be silent. He's actually overhearing my, my talk. Perhaps he'll get converted. Anyway, um, yes, the, the conviction and conversion. Because when you hear, as a man hears, a, a fantastic preacher, and it touches his heart. And that's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's like being touched by the Holy Spirit, and that's a blessing. But it's not necessarily the whole fulfilment. And when when the Lord touches somebody, they've tasted is how the Bible puts it of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, that's a, a, a blessing, but it's to encourage you to go further and seek the author of that blessing. That's what it is. 
Um, it's not something to say, now I've had this experience, so there, therefore I'm in this place and I've received everything that there is. That's actually closing your heart to the Lord. But it doesn't um, alter the fact that a man's life can be changed by being touched by the Holy Spirit if he knows now that there is a God and, and he reforms himself as much as he can, uh, but he can never actually change his heart. And the Lord will show him that because he reveals those areas of the heart that needs that need, uh, changing, need softening and bringing into line with him. Conviction can certainly lead to conversion um, and true conversion will always lead to conviction. Um, it's sometimes, you know, when you're born again, you, don't, you just don't know what's really happened. You know God's done something wonderful. But as you go on, yes, come on. He fills it in from the inside out. That's been the story of our lives. And you discover him in your daily walk. And that is wonderful because it goes on happening. And the older you get, the more wonderful it becomes. I think you can look back and see his patience spread out all along the line. But some of the stupid things that I did and um, did them in my enthusiasm of the time. But, you know, you have to come back and repent. And one goes on doing that. And it's lovely every time we repent because you repent for something far better than you've ever seen. It makes it so just so easy um, to get rid of something that's actually been a burden to you. And you thought you were doing right to carry it. But God says, no, give it to me. Now we come to a very serious note. And I want this to be. Yes, it is a serious note. I can't speak lightly about it. It is this. There's one thing that binds all Christians together. And that is the hope and the wish to get to heaven. But how does each Christian actually expect that to happen? Uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 14 is a very relevant text where Jesus warns that the gate is narrow and the way which is straight, but it's also narrow. And it is not easy in the world looking at it. It's very, very difficult indeed. It becomes easy when you're given to enter it. And the path becomes straight and easy when you're really born of him. But it's, it's a warning. A warning is, my friends, there's been a tremendous amount of basic disbelief that's got into the church and was stirred up. And of course, it will be stirred up. If it's of Satan, it will be stirred up when the blessing of God comes down. And um, I, I don't want to go deep into the theology of it at the moment, but I, I had a horrible vision of what the Lord refers to as rock bottom Christians. That means when the waves of the storm come, and they are here now, my goodness me, but not even, not talking just about the pandemic, I'm coming to that this afternoon, the afternoon, in the second session. Um, the, the, but the rock bottom Christians are people who go on sinning, go on repenting, go on repeating their sins, go on repenting, go on repeating their sins without any better expectation. And instead of floating on the top, they're actually dragging along the rocks at the bottom. And yet they expect to be scooped up miraculously at the time of death and resurrected to heaven, complete with all their sins. My friends, I, I, I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying, but there's huge misunderstanding and we've been very challenged by this ourselves, believe you me. We've been through all manner of fears and things that have come against us and had to have them dispelled. But in, in modern day thinking, there's a great deal of misunderstanding about Romans 7. That's the, that is the most perfect description anywhere in the Bible um, of what it really is like to be a slave to sin. And people don't realize um, that Paul is actually speaking in the past tense. Now, he's speaking, he knows what he's saying because he remembers what that was like when he was a Pharisee. But the, the problem is that people take that because he spoke in the present tense. Now, I'm not a great scholar of, of uh, the original manuscripts, 
But Paul actually says in two uh, of the early verses, around about verse three and five, I think it is, of chapter seven, he actually pre prefaces what he's going to say by saying, you know, once we were bound to this, and but now in the new life that we have, we're set free from these things. He actually tells the reader that before they start on, on, on the rest of chapter seven. But it's like you can say, if you're relating a story, I was on my way to the post office this morning and who should there be but so and so crosses the road in front of me um, and I give him a wave, he waves to me. Uh, you know what I mean? You can speak in the present tense, gives it an immediacy and it, it's, it gives it the, the sense of actually being there yourself. Um, that's, I, I know that's why Paul said it, but the problem is you see that people take that as being proof that if Paul was a slave to sin, it excuses them being a slave to the sin. And, and it'll all be all right because Jesus died for everyone. That is not the full gospel, my friends. It's not what we're here to celebrate. There's no joy in that whatsoever. Um, but, you know, the thing is, it's reading back about the revival. What happened in the revival should spark our anticipation. Um, it's wonderful. It's so much better probably than what we've ever looked, known, and that's fine. Uh, the Lord knows that he doesn't blame you for that if you've never known anything more. And that's the problem nowadays. People don't have the experience like they did of full salvation. There was never any doubt, uh, I'm sure, about that passage of Paul's in Romans 7 um, up to the time um, of, what was the man's name when they became, <laughs> I can't remember his name, um, when, when, when Christianity became adopted by the, by the, by the nation. And the Jewish nation, that's, but anyway, that's, that's changed. But in the, the first Christians knew perfectly well that wasn't the revival experience to be slave to sin. Because what God builds is not for failing. But there are people, of course, around who are, are Christians, they call themselves Christians, and bless them, they, they may be uh, in a measure, but they're called cessationalists because they do not believe any longer that the Holy Spirit is, is able to do the things he did in the New Testament, and they don't believe any longer that holiness is a possibility. And therefore they are vehement against it. They don't talk to us about holiness. We don't want to know about it because people don't want to know about things that they haven't got. Now, my friends, there's something in that for us. We do not assail these people and argue with them. Just be with them. Because that's what God says. Um, that we, we meet people who are hot and strong against this, but if we start an argument, there's no profit in that. And we're, we're, we accept people by their own confession and just be who you are, because that's what the Lord says. That's my instruction from him. <laughs> and he keeps bringing me back to it. Because what God builds is not for failing. And it's the fire that won't go out. And, you know, there's one story I love in the Bible, so precious to me. And Jerry has actually touched right on it just now in, in what he was singing, what he was praying, what he was saying. And that is that about the leaven and the lump. It's a most wonderful, wonderful parable. Um, uh, partly because I, I like the leaven and the lump rather more than the, the, the dough and the yeast because Really, I, I identify totally with being a lump. Um, <laughs> but it, it's a wonderful story because you see Jewish mama makes the bread for, for all her family. You know how lovely Jewish mamas are. I mean, they're fantastic mothers, aren't they? And, and they've got big families and, and she knows how many people are going to partake of the bread she's making. And she knows how much she can make without it going stale um, before it's finished. She probably makes some excess. And when she's made it, she has a huge lump as long as it... It doesn't say the lump has to be a limited size in order that the leaven will, will manage it. Um, she, he, she just has a lump that's big enough for her and she knows it'll last the distance. Then she takes the leaven in her motherly hand and she goes like that and plunges it as far as it'll go into the depth of, of the lump. And the lump, lump probably closes over the top of it, or she can close it over the top. And as Jerry says, um, there may not be 
a difference and the lump may not initially feel any different. But Jesus speaks about the leaven. And he says the leaven works its way through the lump until it comes across a hard bit that it can't manage. Did he say that? No. Jesus said the leaven goes all the way through until the whole <laughs> lump is leavened. He didn't even say, be ye therefore a soft lump. You know, that's, that's the totality of salvation. That is the totality and the outworking of God being the author and the finisher. So my friends, be encouraged wherever you are, whatever you have done, and wherever you may be coming from. Because this is the God of reality. He is our creator. He is more wonderful than we can possibly imagine. How, how am I doing? Fine. I've got one or two uh, times for anecdotes and um, stories of things. Uh, this just is to giving you an added picture of what went on in the revival. The, the first extraordinary thing was the presence of the Lord in the town. And there are big factors that one can put down that down to singing with the Holy Spirit. And we know prayer walking actually is a very powerful thing to do in your town. And that's a wonderful use for tongues mm -hmm. because at each gate or doorway you stand, uh, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what's going on the other side of it. But street conversions in the revival were quite different because people were falling down in the street and begging for forgiveness in public on the pavement. And, you know, it was, it's possible to affect a whole bus queue that way. Um, people may turn their backs on it, not know what's going on. But that prayer will be answered on the pavement. That's where the Lord, he, he wasn't fussy about whether they went to meetings or not. <laughs> because when his presence was on the town, he could afford not to be. That was amazing. Now, the people who came to the church... A lot of them didn't know why on earth they were going, and that actually happens today, and it's going to happen increasingly. And we've had it happen at our church, um, especially with drunks and people on drugs, because there is a ministry for that in, in our church. Um, they find themselves in a church not knowing why they've got there. And some of the, some of the, the sinners were it was amazing. I mean, they just, they, they, their need was so great, they would have been the first to come forward for the appeal because they had nothing to bring they could see that this was something they badly needed but there were also resistant uh, sinners at the back who weren't going to give up drink for anybody um or whatever it, whatever their sin was it could have been anything couldn't it just the same number as there are around today and some of them would make a break for it and they'd try and escape they'd get out through the doors now if they weren't stopped getting out uh, um i don't know whether there are any elders or church officials listening to this but um the elders used to run out at the back and capture them and bring them drag them back in and whether they learnt rugby tackles or on the pavement i honestly didn't know <laughs> but that was the thing but but if the uh, prisoner the chap who'd escaped the sinner was faster than they were guess what would happen god would turn them around and bring them back in. and that happened again and again and again that was the power of the Lord on the streets in those towns who were in revival. There's a most wonderful story told by my dear friend, Duvrig. Uh, I've seen him in the slides and he was the man who was behind me. <laughs> when, when I was praying on Evan Roberts's too. But he tells this wonderful story and I haven't got a, a South Wailing accent like Duvrig did. But there was um, a boy um, who was with his mates, they were, they were drinking beer, and he just ordered a brand new pint of beer. And to his horror, he found that he was physically unable to grip it. His whole wrist was shaking and it was wide open and he could not clench his fist, his hand around the glass. He just couldn't grip it enough to even lift it up. And his mates began to laugh at him, which was intolerable. So he knew he was in trouble and he wanted to find his dad. And so he went home to find his dad. 
and he discovered his dad was not there. There was only one place his dad could possibly be, and that was in the revival. So the boy, in a state of trembling, went off to the revival, still shaking like a leaf, I'm sure, opened the door to see if he could find his father in the chapel. In the chapel. Did I say the church? No, no. I said the revival. So. <laughs> well, it was in where the revival was, yes. Mm. Yes, and he went inside the door into the, where the revival was happening, and he saw his father up at the front praying for his son. And that's an amazing story. That used to happen so often. People in the church used to pray, and sometimes repeatedly, uh, for members of the family, and the family would actually appear while the prayer was still in, 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 in progress. Now, there's another lovely story about um, a mine manager, because there was a tremendous amount of industrial unrest, and mine owners were despised, as you saw what happened, didn't you, in Bethesda with Lord Penryn and that awful grip that he had on those miners, refusing to listen to them. And that was an extreme example, but that was very commonplace on bigger or lesser scales. And there was one ma manager in South Wales of the mine who, who had been an elder in his church for well over 25 years. I think it was 28 years, but I can't remember the exact figure. And he had heard about these meetings that were going on down in the mines. And the meetings were going on in so many of them uh, as well. And so he decided, really, it was about time he actually went down. I don't think he was going down to tell them off for it. I don't think that was, that was his motive. I think he was going down just to find out what was actually happening. And he had a perfect right to do that. He was, he was the mine owner. Well, he went down by himself in the cage, there was a rope suspended, he went right down into the mine in itself. And he got out right in the middle of the meeting that the miners were having by the, by the light of the safety lamps with no official presence, no vicars, no pastors. Um, and the repentance was going on down there within a very, very few moments, the mine manager realized that although he'd been an elder for, for whatever it was, 28 years, he'd obviously never ever been born again. And he, had, he was big enough in front of the miners to confess that. Do you know what happened? The miners all gathered around him at once and they prayed him straight through into the kingdom. Just a day's incident during revival. Now you've all heard the story of the police in white gloves. <laughs> That's amazing too. I mean, you saw it in Bethesda. Um, they had no work to do. And in Bethesda, they formed choirs and went, went around singing to the churches. I mean, that's just a precious thing to do. It's an acknowledgement of what God had done in their town. And they wanted to pay something back um, for what he had done. They went around actually singing uh, choirs. Um, to, uh, it's amazing. And I think I told you the story about the transatlantic captains. That was, that was astonishing. That was the early days of, well, it was, um, was it, actually it was in the 1850s, it was the Finney revival, wasn't it, that uh, affected them. How, how whole boatloads of people repented as the boat was approaching the, the east, east coast of America, New England. Quite amazing. And a lot of people were saved without ever having been near a meeting. And I had a friend who said, I think there were 52 transatlantic sea captains who were converted. Many of them, again, without going anywhere near a meeting. They didn't know what would happen to them, but they discovered it. And there's also one locally to here in Bangor University, um, when the revival was going in Kamavechen and in Bangor, um, singing broke out first in one lecture theatre. And the, the lecture stopped and everybody, including the lecturer, began singing. And sure enough, it spread. And soon the entire university was singing hymns in the middle of a working day. So it's amazing. Our eyes, Lord, are here to be opened afresh as to all the things you can do and, and long to do 
and are about to do. And I really believe that. So there we are. That's, I don't know what you want to do, Jerry. I'm happy to go straight on if you want to um, talk about what's coming. Yes, straight away. Right, straight away. So we have now a system. Rachel's going to feed me the notes. There we go. Yes. I want to start this, my friends, personally, by, by saying something which I heard, and I can't remember who spoke it to me, but I think it may have been um, David Hathaway, the evangelist. Um, but he spoke of three, there we are, three types of faith. Um, one is in your praying, it, it's faith for something which the Lord has started. So you're praying into something, Lord, will you complete what you have begun? And that's a perfectly legitimate faith. The second one is praying for something for which there is no sign on the ground yet of it happening. That's a more difficult prayer of faith, and it may take longer to be answered. That's up to the Lord. But the third type of faith is the most difficult of all. And it is when you are praying for something which is absolutely opposite to what is going on at the present. It is something where all the signs in front of you are the exact opposite of what you are praying for. <laughs> My friends, I have to say that is very true. And that's how I feel today. I do not claim to be a prophet. I've been out in the night praying about this. <laughs> the Lord never fails. I've only got one message. It's a message of utter and complete hope. That is the only word I've got to bring. And the reason is that I cannot know the Lord for anything less, unlikely and impossible as it may seem. We're going to unravel these things and very definitely bring the the um, uh, hang on, I've got my words. Um, we're, just, we're just going to unravel these things. Yes, we're going to bring the coronavirus into this, and I'm actually going to unmask it so that we can understand what it is and why it's come, and all these things. Now, I want to start this with a prophecy that was given by. Uh, David Wilkerson um, in 1986. Jay, do, do you want that to go up? Okay, just go ahead and keep speaking. And then as right. you do so, we will access That's right. Great stuff. Um, now, Dave, Dave Wilkerson um, was well known in Times Square in New York because he was the one who converted the gangsters and um, uh, he wrote uh, The Sword and the Switchblade. But this was said in 1986, which was tragically around about the, just before he passed away, he had an untimely accident. Now, this is a prophecy. Now, do listen to this, every word of it. This is what he said in 1986. I see a plague coming on the world. And the bars, the churches and government will shut down. The plague will hit New York City and shake it like it has never been shaken. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles. And repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit. And out of it will come a third great awakening that will sweep America and the world. My friend, do notice this, what he's saying. He's not only prophesied something which can only possibly refer to exactly what's happening now. There's no other event that I can think of uh, that can remotely be confused with, with what's happening now. And he speaks to it absolutely directly. But notice how he finishes. Out of it will come a great third awakening that will sweep not only America, but the whole world. Amen. Amen. And it was given in 19... yeah, 1986, yes. yes. So, 
Thank you very much. That's a super slide if you're unlucky. Look at the determination in his eye. Mm -hmm. There's the things that Dave Wilkerson used to say. He says, you don't hear very much about repentance, he said, from modern pulpits. That was his message. And lots of people repented because of his preaching. Well, let's start with a big question then. And I'm going to answer these questions absolutely as they come to me. The big question was, who sent coronavirus? And I'm going to come to that very soon. The first question really is, we ask ourselves is, why does God allow this? Because nothing happens unless God does allow it, that we, we must know. Is it because of our sins? The answer has got to be very probably yes. It's not just us, but it's the sins of our nation. Um, it's nations that God is in this for, as well as the individual. He's in for the individual first, of course. But we look at what's happening to us now and say, is, can we find in history any precedent for this? Well, we can. There are lots of precedents. Um, it's well, well seen right through um, biblical. The Old Testament shows it very much that where a nation has departed from God's laws and despised God, turned its back on God, um, they get plagues and they get wars, battles, which they lose. Uh, they get taken into um, another country, taken away from, from where they are. There's lots of things that the devil can bring upon people. They're, they're all brought upon themselves, really, by the fact that they've turned away from God. Now, I actually want to do an unusual thing and go back a long way in time to the prophet Habakkuk, uh, we call him Habakkuk in England, but I, the Americans aren't always right, actually, but uh, they drive on the wrong side of the road to start with. But Habakkuk, I think it uh, uh, appeals to me, it's got two Ks in the middle. And Habakkuk's story was approximately 600 years uh, before Christ came in the first place. And he, li he lived in uh, Judah. And he had seen good times in Judah because the King Josiah of Judah was a good king. And he brought in a lot of reforms and Judah was greatly blessed during his reign. But his son was a bad penny, a bad lot, as often happens. And so Judah was in a process of falling away. And what Habakkuk does, he prays to God because he can see that dreadful things are going on around him. The society has gone sinful round about his ears, and the, the bad things that people were doing didn't seem to be punished as he thought they should be. So he was praying to God and saying, God, how can you look down upon your people going this way without doing something? He said, God, I want you to do something. I need you to do something, and I can't think why you aren't. Do you know something? I think the Lord loves to be spoken to like that, because that's what he designed man for. Um, to, to, to love him as he is and to be close to him and speak to him as a man. He, he liked it when Moses made God change his mind, didn't he? And when the Lord was going to, he was so angry with the children of Israel, having set them free and yet seen them with their idols. So Habakkuk didn't think God was listening, but he was. And then God answered him one day suddenly. And he said, I have heard your prayer and they've come unto me. I've heard every one of them. He said, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. So, of course, you can imagine Habakkuk really listening. He said, I'm going to send the Babylonian army across you. Oh, my goodness. Do I want that? <laughs> that was exactly the opposite the answer from what Habakkuk expected, that the Lord was going to raise the Babylonian army I mean, they were absolutely all conquering and they were going to go right through poor little Judah and they were going to rob, destroy and do untold damage. Was How can that possibly be God's cure? So that sent Habakkuk into the most urgent prayer, which is what we're doing now, saying, the Lord, what is going on? How can you possibly send such an evil nation as, as, the, as the Babylonians right through our presence and all the damage they're going to cause 
can never be undone. And the Lord agreed with him. He said, that, he said you're quite right in what you pray. Um, but Habakkuk actually prayed more basically than that. If you really look through what he was saying, he was spoke, speaking with, with respect. But he said, Lord, he said, you're not like that. You're, you're not the sort of God. He actually questioned God's divinity and, and his divine purposes. Are you really the God I've been believing in? And he knew he was, but he said, I have a great respect for you, Lord. And what he did, he prayed really a revival prayer. Um, he wanted to read through all the gospels he had, and it wasn't much of a gospel. But it was, of course, what there was. But he hadn't got Jesus, but he did have the Exodus. He had the he, he knew the story of God's great deliverance and the parting of the Red Sea. And so to him, that was his gospel. And he went to it and got out of it every single miracle that he could list that God had done. It took him time, but it was a wonderful study. It's just like studying revivals in the past to know what God can do. And finally, Habakkuk reached such a place of closeness with the Lord that if you read chapter 3, verse 18 is the final cry. Um, he, he actually comes out with the most incredible scenario that he paints a picture of absolute hopelessness all around him, a picture of a society of for which have been ravaged by the Babylonians, of which there is no chance whatsoever of recovery, either financially or in any other way. There are no, no cattle in the pens. There's no currency that was, of course, in those days. Absolutely nothing they could ever repay their debts with. But he said, yet I'm going to praise God, my saviour. Nowadays, it will be God, that's his office as God, and Jesus Christ my savior but it's an amazing story it's well worth reading it's only three chapters long and i did it for my church quite recently and uh, had a great effect on me but it does illustrate the present and i don't actually know wh whether the babylonians they probably did come there were lots of skirmishes and um, the bible doesn't say it was probably a local thing but the precedent was there entirely right where am i trish Oh, yes. There we are. Now, one of those things, when this happens and one is overrun by something, and this coronavirus has done this to us now, it affects the entire civilization. And it takes both the good and the bad. It's unfair. And, and we've seen that totally, haven't we? Um, it, it, it affects good men, bad men. It doesn't mean that because you've caught the coronavirus that you're a bad man. That's the devil's heart. That God gets blamed for it, I'm sure. But that is the devil's heart. He will. He is here to for death and destruction. That is the name of his game. That's a very sinister game. So let's look at ourselves next. By ourselves, I mean our nation as well. We're speaking very much from that because that's what we're personally here most involved with and the world we live in i I'd just like to say before i start on these remarks that um there are certain nations that have a special place either through the history or through the future or probably both um and one of them of course is israel the absolute time clock of the end times um, and the lord's promise on israel i mean that is absolutely stands completely uh, in in a, a realm of its own but of the so-called the rest of the world america and the uk um, are probably historically uh, the most uh, the strongest representation of, of what the free world should be about and the lord wants our heritages back that's, we know that from prayer for Parliament. We, Rachel and I used to go, do that. We can't pray at Parliament anymore because of, of shutdown. But well, let's just look at ourselves and see where we are. And we find the decline of morality is something that couldn't possibly have been imagined in 1904, 1905, when the Welsh Revival took place. I mean, if they heard what was happening to us now, they could never believe it. But you see, they never had TV. They never had the internet. 
and they never had the instant access to pornography so readily available and also the availability of drugs etc the fact is that we and i'm speaking now for the uk we have abandoned our heritage and we repent of this oh my goodness may we do in parliament prayer in westminster when you have big ben <laughs> timing over above that's great because you're praying inside the lord's house and it is his heritage that the lord wants back because we've completely departed haven't we from the laws that we've had that have served us so well over hundreds of years those laws were based on biblical principles but our politicians our politicians the, the seat of guilt very much is in westminster um, they have redefined a new morality away from god altogether now you know what i'm saying uh, they have changed the rules and regulations and the, the whole of the new morality is completely in the opposite direction from God. Now, I, I'm going to say this openly, in, uh, this is concerning Britain, that the, the changes that went through under um, the first uh, government with David Cameron was very, very much the product of the EU. The European Union influenced very heavily um, David Cameron and attempts to influence our constitution and of course stop us leaving. I'm not going to go into the politics of that, but the new morality did come from the EU because you see same-sex marriage wasn't even on the conservative agenda when they went for the election that David Cameron eventually won. And uh, this is a, a, a very powerful thing, but that's between us and, the, and Europe and um, it's not in place here. But our politicians have chosen to legalize interpersonal relationships, things like same-sex marriage, which are absolutely contrary, uh, not just to God's laws, but against the very purpose for which we were created. So knowingly or unknowingly, people are actually sinning against their own creation and against the function of their own, which their own bodies were designed for. Children from the age of only four are now proposed to be taught how to arouse themselves to what the Bible openly describes as sin. They're going to be sex, sexualized, that's a horrible word, but it means woken up physically in ways that they're not nearly ready for. And I think this leads to permanent damage. I, I make no bones about it, I'm sure it does. It's years before they can develop naturally. They're not even going to be allowed to develop naturally without being conscious of these things. Children have got enough to cope with growing up and learning and mixing with their schoolmates without being faced with problems that they can never understand. And schools generally are encouraged to exclude God. He's often being cut out of general assemblies. There's every encouragement to exclude God from teaching, from teaching creation. It's all about evolution. And right through all of this, the church has really has largely lost its credibility it certainly has it carries little influence against the government the government knows it doesn't have to listen to churches and it can carry on regardless now that's not always so i know in brazil um, the churches have tremendous say over the governments they've had a revival um, in brazil of, of a kind um, something like 45 percent of people in uh, sao paulo where we were once um, uh, 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 very genuine Christians and baptism of the Spirit is everywhere. The other thing is that we're increasingly in Britain and elsewhere in the world denied free speech. We're not allowed the liberty or the right to defend our beliefs. And we have the abomination. Oh, this is such an awful grief to me. I, I've learned so much about this recently of a world abortion industry. It's not just, it's, that's a shocking thing, my friends, the number of, of unborn children, and that's what they are. They, they call them fetuses, if you like, they're creations. They've got a, a destiny on each one of them, if only they were allowed to live. There are mass, lots of times more abortions than there are people dying through the coronavirus. And this, of course, is the spirit of Moloch. That was a spirit of, of child sacrifice, is having a field day now. 
but it's worse than that is the corruption which drives it. The, uh, how do we talk about an abortion industry? That is disgusting. And there is corruption and it's about to be revealed in, in our country, in Britain. Um, there is collusion between civil servants um, and, and the abortion, the abortionists, they, 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 they get millions and millions of pounds out of abortions. I just want to say that is a shocking corruption and it explains a lot of things. On top of this, we have tiny minorities, you know who I'm referring to, insist on promoting aberrant behavior, which is sexually deviant and completely and utterly against God's law. My friends, I'm sorry to go on. We have children, we're supposed to be allowed to choose each day whether they decide to be a boy or a girl. Come on. The Bible says mankind was created male and female. Ask any midwife. But the overall message that comes out of our society today, and I think this is a worldwide problem, but obviously it varies in different countries, but the message is clear. Let's do away with God altogether so that we can please ourselves, because no God needs no sin. Now, what about the silent majority? You see, the silent majority is a huge majority. The number of people who actually go along with Stonewall and all these people, a very, very small percentage of our society, um, the, the vast majority stays silent or has done until now. And I want us to ask and to see, what is the fear of death, which is what Corona is giving us? What is that doing to people? Be encouraged, because we see the start of these things already. It is turning people to God. And it does that naturally. And the Lord knew this in advance. He knew it in Hab Habakkuk's time. <laughs> of course he did. But the, the fear of death brings an immediate reckoning. We're, we, we're so secure in the world we've built around us. The fear of death, when it comes, it really makes you count the scores. Uh, particularly of what you're doing and where you're going and and the people turn to God and if you noticed I'm sure already how non-Christians and even atheists when the when when the chips are really down we say you know when uh, it, it's really on us they they look up and turn to God even if they don't believe in him or haven't before you know we've known a man who was facing death because of his drinking habit and he prayed an unusual prayer on a street corner in North Wales, actually. And he was about to cross the road when he looked up to heaven in his despair, because he'd been told that if he, he would be dead in six weeks if he didn't kick his drinking habit. And he looked up to heaven, not having been a believer of any kind. He said, if there's anyone up there, now is a good time to do something. That was his sinner's prayer. And he was delivered of his addiction. So the threat of death is very real, and we can see this turning people to God. Now, I want to move on and speak about Corona specifically. And I am going to unmask it. I do not claim to be a prophet, but I can only know the Lord as I know him, and I can only speak what I know is consistent with what he desires in his heart. Because we are in a, a terrific war in heavenly places. The war is in heavenly places, that's very important to understand. But it is being waged here on the earth and across the earth. It is involving all nations. Now, um, it's, the public can probably see this. I mean, the battle is between uh, good and evil, but it's more than that, of course, it's between, between God and the devil. Because the battle is in heaven and it, it is fought out on earth. And that's exactly how that has always been. The world has always been a battlefield. Jesus came into it and um, he knew all about battles and all about where they come from. So let's look at who the battle is between. Very basically, 
let's look at our Father God. He knows our design, which was originally in his own image. So he has more of a closeness with our design than we can imagine. He knows our fall in the Garden of Eden. He knew it from the beginning. And when it happened, his mercy was ready to receive Adam and Eve in their guilt. He sacrificed the first sacrifice, wasn't it? It was a lamb in order to clothe the nakedness that they suddenly felt. Our God, he knows the future, absolutely, and has it in his control. He is never, ever taken by surprise. Does that sound good to you? Hey, <laughs> come on. It's an uneven contest, you know. The devil, what about him? What are his credentials? He is a proven liar, absolutely proven over generations. Jesus called him the father of lies. He cannot create, that is very important, but he can corrupt. That's the, the big difference, that he can corrupt what God has created to a point, even that's under God's control. But the devil knows how to destroy and kill. It's his, it's his whole business, isn't it? It's what he's for, it's his heart. He can bring plagues, he can certainly bring storms. Um, anybody who was on David Hathaway's Caesarea mission can know all about that. Caesarea. Yes, absolutely. The storm was attempting to blow the Caesarea mission completely out of bounds and not happen. It's amazing. And, and David Hathaway and others, we prayed against it. And sure enough, the wind dropped enough. Demonic storms usually come very suddenly. And, and, and they did, of course, when Jesus was crossing Galilee with his disciples in the boat to the other side. Um, accidents can happen and the devil can promote those um, at traffic accidents, but all sorts of different sorts of physical and medical accidents. And of course, military warfare and being on the wrong end of a bad enemy. We know what that's about. The devil can certainly, and this is the thing, he can pervert the truth of who God is. And, you know, he's been about that ever since Genesis chapter three, when he lied, the most wicked lie that's ever been ever been spoken to Eve. Um, dear Eve, who was built to be looked after and built to put her trust in a man. And her trust was in God. And then the devil came and sowed the seeds and said, you don't want to believe that. God's not like that at all, really. And, he, and painted a completely different picture of God. And the devil is doing that all the time. He has never got off that. That is the name of his game. But the good news is that the devil can't change the truth in any measure whatsoever. He can try as hard as he likes, and he's trying very hard now. He does not know God's timing, and he does not know God's next move. The devil's aim, then, is very straightforward. He wants to conquer the world and rule over it. Do you realize what corona means? It means crown. And it's the devil's crown. And the devil intends to wear it. So, so what's... God's intention. God's intention is to open the eyes of the world, which is what he did in revival. But this time, it's not just Wales and other countries from Wales. It's the whole world all at once. And he's going to begin it with his church in order that we may become his true people and he will be our true God. Now, that, that was his heart's cry right through all the problems of the Old Testament. And it's his heart's cry today. And of course, it's the very thing for which Jesus died. The devil's main weapon, which we're experiencing now, is fear. My friends, I ask you, each one of you, what 
is as God's antidote, what is his answer to fear? Going to have to be according to his promises. Amen. It's love, isn't it? Now, Jerry, I, I think it's a good place to take a, a short break. I'm going to come back and address the demonic coronavirus. But in the meantime, we've reached a point where God has decreed what he's going to do. And his answer to this is going to be love. So please come back in five or ten minutes. We'll look forward to joining you. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I'll leave this on. Be quiet. As you said, yes.